How's it going, everybody? My name is Vincent Miss Isaac, and welcome to Lost Boat 6 at 3. This is the crazy and epic finale to Lost Boat 6, the three-act story that I've been going through throughout the past month that it's been releasing. And ever since it's been releasing, I've just been enjoying everything about it, whether it's the characters, the story, the world building, or just how it engrossed me since the first section. I'm going to keep my thoughts on Act 3 for the spoiler-free review a little short because my opinion hasn't changed. I really like this Lost Boat. You could probably tell from the title. So I'll put Act 1 and Act 2 in the description below if you want to see those as well. So my review for Act 3, 10 out of 10 story for sure. My favorite act out of all three of them. And overall, Lost Boat 6 is, again, the best part of FGO entirely. Definitely my favorite story out of all the Lost Boats, singularities, sub-singularities, events, anything. It was so good. I loved it. And I hope that's enough to convince you to go and play if you already played FGO and haven't caught up yet. Or if maybe you're interested and had a lingering suspicion, like maybe I should play it. Definitely go give it a watch. And I can't wait to talk about more story content coming out for this game in the future, especially with Lost Boat 7, because I can't wait for that. Of course, I'm going into this as blind as I can, so please don't say anything about it if you know anything. <laughs> but regardless, without further ado, this is my thoughts and opinions on Lost Boat 6, Act 3. I hope you all enjoy, and I'll see you all at the end of the video. So, we pick up where we last left off with an interlude starting off Act 3. And this interlude just basically gives us a little summary as to what happened between the end of Morgan and where we're going to start off with the coronation. So you pick up with the Stormbutter crew where they've been living in almost complete darkness just barely getting by for 45 days. And they get a letter from Da Vinci saying like, yeah, so we're done. We're going to be leaving soon so you know you guys can get ready and we'll meet up with you guys soon. So everybody's just super happy the operation is done. And after the coronation, they're going to go over to the Stormbutter crew and they're going to be chilling. Everybody's celebrating, but Holmes feels like something is wrong. They, they haven't found out a lot of the plot points, a lot of the missing details of this Lost Boat. And while you don't really need to, at the end of the day, you did defeat Morgan. He still feels like something is going to happen. And this is his intuition talking too, so everybody takes his word for it, and they all stay on high alert, ready for anything to go down. But then we cut away to everybody going back to Salisbury. Percival stays behind in Camelot. So does Vargas, and they're just basically there helping the round table army but also communicating with the upper fairies because Noctaria is going to be the crown queen instead of Artoria she relinquished the battle to Noctaria so she was just declared the winner so Percival stayed behind to help excavate the Rango Miniat spears for Caldea meanwhile Vargas stayed behind to help the round table army but also be a mediator for Noctaria and the northern fairies and the upper crust of upper fairies in Camelot and with that, we cut away back to the main group, and they're all the way back in Mike's bar in Salisbury, where the coronation's going to be held in the cathedral. In the bar, we have Habit Trial, who's up on the second floor relaxing, because ever since the battle with Morgan, she's just been super drained for some reason, even though she never fought. Kakolin, or Kukaster, whichever you prefer, goes over to Nocturia's camp before she comes over to go ask her a couple questions. So we cut away to Nocturia and Kukaster talking in her camp, and she's basically telling him like, yo, so Morgan and Queen Maeve had a deal before Morgan took the throne, right? Because Maeve had just as much magical energy as Morgan, or at least enough to rival her. So they had a deal in place where if Morgan weakened or she died, the king clad would take place as Britain's new ruler. And since Morgan fell, it makes sense for Nakaria, who's Maeve's predecessor, to follow that rule. Another reason though is because Nocturia is the only fairy besides Artoria maybe to handle all the energy that was in the throne. So that explains why she didn't want anybody to damage the throne all the way back in the Morgan section because the throne is the reason why all the fairies are able to be reincarnated and born again after the war that happened back in the year 400 in this Lost Boat's history. Because they were supposed to die out, that's what Beryl saw when he first got there. But Morgan used her energy and put it into the throne to recycle all their lives and just their energy. And now everybody just gets ready to go over to the cathedral in time for the coronation. And that's the end of interlude one. So this section is called the end coronation ceremony and like dashes. I don't know if anything could sound more foreboding. <laughs> so as the ceremony gets underway though, we see all these high profile fairies like Aurora, like Spriggan, all these people, right? We don't see Vargas because she's still back in Camelot, but we see Percival. 
so our party, including Artoria, Muramasa, Kakolin, Fujimaru, Mash, and Percival, Habitrot stayed back at the bar because she's still super sick, are all here. They're, we're like way back in the back. But we get handed some wine, the same wine that Noctaria gets handed when she walks up the stage and she's in front of everybody, right? As Noctaria has the wine in her hand, she's giving a speech and everything, and then to cap it all off, she goes to drink the wine, right? We all in our party don't drink the wine because A, Fujimaru, he isn't of age yet, so he doesn't do it. Mash follows suit and everybody else just follows because why not? And interrupting the ceremony before she's inaugurated and after she drank the wine, a couple of northern fairies come up and they just start spilling a bunch of dirt on Noctaria's name. A lot of information about the northern fairies is revealed here, like how Mab's corpse is the entirety of the King Clan area. And the reason why Nakhnaria exists is because that corpse, which is still active to this day, gave birth to her. And we already knew that Nakhnaria was specially made from Maeve, but the way that it's revealed here is just, it manages to sway all the fairies that are in attendance. And then we also get revealed like, oh, the way that she removes Moore's curse from fairies is just transferring it to other fairies and then making them into the giant corpse and just a bunch of stuff about the working class and how if you get her love then you basically become a slave to her and Noctaria is trying to come up with a bunch of rebuttals for each one but it's not enough to sway the fairies back into her camp so a lot of the Salisbury knights and just a bunch of people start revolting against her and she starts spilling blood because when she drank the wine she knew that it was poison she drank it in full faith that like all right somebody tried to kill me this wine is not enough to affect me, to kill me in any sense of the word. The only reason it's not able to kill her is because of her connections to all the fairies. If she has a bunch of followers, then she gets stronger and stronger. But because there's a bunch of doubt and unrest brewing in this area, a lot of the northern fairies start doubting her and so she can't handle the poison like she normally would be. And so we get down there, we start trying to help out Nakhnaria because she gets stabbed in the back. And she's dying and because all the fairies start doubting her and losing faith in her her memories are leaving as well because if you remember Nakhnaria shares part of herself with those fairies so if they start leaving her then all of her memory and her being leaves as well so when she's dying in Artoria's arms it's basically like she's barely there she remembers Artoria she remembers who she is but she doesn't remember who Nakhnaria is who she is herself and so she's dying and she just pleads with Artoria, like, just keep following that star, you know, just giving her some last words. And Artoria is devastated by this. This is her best friend. And she's gone in the blink of an eye because fairies. Every single time she's lost something or someone is because of fairies. And so they're all about to leave, but then somebody tries to attack Fujimaru, but Mash intercepts just in time. And it turns out to be Melusine. And she's about to try to kill all of them. But then Percival, since he's with us, he hits her with a crazy speech 100 check. And it works completely, just chastising her. And it works because Percival is her little brother. So why wouldn't it, right? And so she leaves and she's looking over all of Salisbury. And it's turned into a complete war zone. All these fairies are fighting. Everybody's just beefing. And she looks further away. And you can see that all of Britain is starting to turn into a war zone. Because other things are arising, not just the fairies. We cut away to Bargus where we see a bunch of Moors coming out of the pit and they're trying to invade Camelot and all of Britain. And so Bargus tries to get all the fairies, all the round table army out of here. So she sends them away and she's basically trying to defend or escape covering their flank. The curse of the black dog is starting to affect her. So she's going to start acting out crazy soon. But for right now, she's trying her best to just defend the fairies and the humans. But that marks the end of the ceremony. Man, this is so sad. <laughs> this is so sad. So as we continue, I want to drop the name of this section right now. It's literally called The End. <laughs> this section is even more foreboding than the last one. <laughs> but as we continue, everybody gets out of Salisbury and they go into the forest. And there's just even more moors than there were ever before, right? And so we're just trying to fight them off. Percival is still here with us, but he can barely fight. So we just basically take him away and just dip, right? And then we cut away to a couple of other perspectives. So Spriggan is all the way back in Warwick now, and he's in his own vault, but we don't really care about him because he, he's a bum. But the one important thing about him is that we learned Aurora was the one that orchestrated the murder of Nocnaria, right? And we've seen glimpses of Aurora's true nature 
throughout the entire story and why Coral is actually the better person compared to Aurora. And now it's just definitive, Coral it really is the better person. It's still not fully explained yet, so I'm not going to go into it, but just know that Aurora is the worst out of all the clan heads besides Spriggan. She is, oh my goodness, she's sinister. <laughs> but then we actually cut away to Aurora, and Coral's talking to her, basically just like, yo, so there's a bunch of refugees outside that we need to bring in. There's some people reporting signs of Morse curse inside. Salisbury has been locked up, but we need to open the gates, Aurora. This is my plan to do whatever, right? And Aurora was like, nah, just lock it up kill all the people with Morse curse basically just prioritize our lives over theirs and then Coral was just like well why why would we do that and then Aurora was like listen Coral don't worry about it just let it resolve itself and so it cuts away to Maria now and she learns about her Nidos and just all the stuff going on with them right how Brain is basically trying to kill all the fairies on it itself you know before Maria gets to really elaborate more on that someone comes up behind her and kills her and they have like a black weird arm and they revealed to Murian that the Fang clan did kill the Wing clan but they were behind it the whole time the person that stabbed her and then Murian dies before Konya Skanya gets there and Konya Skanya is talking to her for a little bit and she's just like hey promise me that you'll protect Britain and Konya Skanya is like yeah I will don't worry and so Murian's dead now and then we cut away back to the main party where we see Regibrit there because Aurora told them to follow the group and since Regibrit has complete and utter respect for our group he's like yeah, yeah I mean shoot I'll help you guys out for as long as I can because at the end of the day you guys are true heroes true knights so I'm gonna get you guys to where you need to be and then whatever it takes I'll do it so we ride on Regibrit and he takes us all the way back to the storm border and it takes like a day and a half to get there but we get there by the time we get there, the cart is literally falling apart. Regibit is almost dead from exhaustion and literally it falls apart and he's just like, listen, you guys gotta keep going without me. I can't go any further. I've got you guys as far as I could finish the rest. I believe in you all. And then he falls, you know, he falls and we leave him there. But we go to the storm border. So once we get on the ship, we fly up and we just see all of Britain on fire. Everything is being raised to the ground. We see Vargas going all the way over to Manchester. And we actually go over there to see her. But then we see literally Vargas has been turned into a giant black dog. And she's just not her anymore. So when we try to save her, we have to leave because she's just too strong. We can't do anything about her. And so she's going over to Oxford. But it's going to take like five hours for that to happen. So we have to find a way to plan out something against her, right? We see something crawl out of the great pit. And it's Hernanos, the god that's been seen all throughout these murals. One thing I forgot to mention was Percival's backstory and something that was revealed. Where Percival was actually a substitute for the Child of Prophecy made by Woodwos and raised by Melusine. And while Melusine had no ill intentions of raising Percival, everybody else who was involved in that project basically did. He was selected by the Spear of Selection, a sex weapon. And he's able to use it because only humans are able to use the Spear of Selection. So when he first was selected by the spear, he was 10 years old and it accelerated his age. So he had a 20 year old body. And so with the current day that we're in in Britain, he's 26 years old. When in originally he would have been 16 like Artoria. And when he used it again against Woodwows, he didn't get any older because humans only live up to 30 years old in this universe. So he should basically be dead, but because of his constitution, he's still alive somehow, but he's barely breathing. And he basically just apologizes to Artoria for making the round table army as basically a front. But Artoria's like, hey, listen, you did what you could and I respect you for it, Percival. But regardless, we go over to Camelot next to the pit and we try to get the Rongo Miniat spears, but we learned from Kukulin earlier. I didn't mention this. We can't use the spears because they're divine constructs. And since proper human history has been wiped clean, we can't use those divine constructs. There has to be certain stipulations and we don't meet those stipulations. So there's no point in going for them. And Camelot has already been destroyed. So now we just basically have to leave because we can't do anything. Even though if Herninos and if Vargas escape, they're going to become proper human history threats, not just Britain. Because again, this is a singularity. This is no longer a lost belt. They would basically just cause and wreak havoc. But we can't do anything about it. We're not strong enough. We don't have the facilities. So we try to escape, but all the hands of Hardenos just start grabbing and crawling from underneath Britain and trying to get the storm border. But Konya Skanya shows up last second because the Marines request to save Britain. And she just assumes that like, hey, 
this is the only way to save Britain is by saving Caldea because they planned on saving Britain. So she takes some of the curse that Hermanos is dishing out and then she leaves letting us have a way to just escape. And then we're just here in complete shambles not knowing what to do. How do we handle this going forward? The world might end. What do we do? And then Merlin starts talking to them. And if you remember, Merlin was actually talking to Artoria when she was a lot younger. So he's been here before, just never physically. He's only been here through the staff of selection, right? And so he's communicating with us. He can never show up physically. It's just like an illusion. But he's basically like, listen, we can change things. You just got to trust me. I'll take you to Avalon. And so everybody decides to trust Merlin. And the only people that are able to go are Fujimaru, Mash, Artoria, and Muramasa. And we go straight into Avalon. And that's the end of the end. <laughs> All right. So now we continue on to the section called epic of creation and this section goes into the creation of britain so as merlin is contacting everybody on the stone border he's basically just like all right i'm gonna take you guys to avalon and the way he's gonna do it is by using like albion's tunnel basically through the corpse and all that to take them to the center of britain which is where avalon is located and one thing that's mentioned is that kakolin was actually summoned for this exact purpose to get artoria into avalon whether she's dead or alive, Odin wanted him to do this. And the reason for it is because Artoria is basically going to be the basis for making Excalibur. And Artoria herself mentions this because she knew Kakolin was here just for that purpose. Because the Bells were basically giving her that information and she's known this ever since she was born. Like, yo, I'm going to be the basis for Excalibur. She just never told anybody. You also got to remember the Fey eyes as well. So she could basically tell what people were thinking the whole time. And so as Fujimaru, Mash, Artoria, and Muramasa leave with Merlin, everybody else on the stone border stays and they just wait for their arrival. So as we go into the cave of Albion, we have Merlin basically tell us the, the entire conception of Britain. And it starts off with what we already knew, where Hernuno showed up after six fairies were there with no land, no nothing except just ocean, right? And he was just having a fun time with the fairies, living, loving, laughing and everything. And he had a little human on top of him who was his priestess. But after things settled down, the fairies started getting jealous. Like, all right, well, you're, you're here and we're having merriment and everything. Well, why aren't you giving us any land? And so the fairies, after just wondering where the land is, everything, not getting what they wanted on top of that, the priestess was chastising them for their sins, decided to plot to kill Hernandez, right? And so they held a, a little festival, a little feast. And so once the feast is underway, they give him some wine that was poisoned and it kills him completely. And the fairies dissected the priestess little by little, making sure that she stayed alive so they could have her DNA to make humans. And so after his death, the fairies basically used Hernanos' body as a land. And ever since then, every time fairies would die and they expand, they would use their bodies as land mass. So that's why fairy Britain grew but they never really exceeded the population that they had because they couldn't make more people. And the reason why the pit was formed was because that was the area where Hernanos was located, right? And he refused for any fairy to have any land built on top of him. And it's a huge area because Hernanos himself is huge. He isn't all of Britain. It's just he takes up one part of it, but he can control it because it's built around him. His hatred and his strong emotion towards the fairies were what kept causing the calamities and the great calamities. Because they were just Hernanos basically fighting back against the fairies. Because the whole reason why Hernanos came down to Fairy Britain was because he was meant to kill all the fairies that were still alive because of their arrogance, right? Because they were the ones meant to make the Excalibur that is in proper human history, right? But for Fairy Britain. But they didn't because they were lazy. And so when Sephar showed up and started killing everybody, Excalibur wasn't there to stop it. And so that's why there was just nothing there in Fairy Britain. So Sephar is a type moon creature that landed on Earth and wiped out a bunch of the ancient civilizations that we hear about, like Atlantis. And the only way that it was stopped was because of Excalibur. And so to rectify this, they're going to make Excalibur in Avalon to rectify this singularity. Because you got to remember, Morgan worked so much in this Lost Boat that she changed it into a singularity. The Lost Boat tree is gone. Apparently, Sephar is from Fate Extella, which I definitely would not know because the only Fate property that I have read is this. And that doesn't mean that I haven't watched the others. It's just this is the only one that I've actually gone to read. And then we, we progress and so we see Morgan's era and everything and how she basically 
revitalized all of Britain after it almost ended. <laughs> so two things to make note of here. Cardinalos is just a dead body. There's nothing alive in him anymore. No consciousness. So if we go to fight him, we're just basically putting this god to rest once and for all after all the years of torture and suffering he's gone through. The second thing is that the whole time that we're in Avalon and go into this cave, Merlin was transformed into foe so he could just transport himself better. He doesn't realize this, but we do. <laughs> but with that being said, we move on from the epic of creation and go on to the moment a star is born. The subtitle to this entire Lost Boat. So, now we go into the moment a star is born. This section starts off with us going through Artoria's memories after having passed through Avalon's test to get into it. But now we have to pass through it to be able to make Excalibur. And Merlin's just basically telling us like, yeah, so Artoria, you're going to be seeing these. Well, we're going to be fighting these manifestations of your memories. So she's going to disappear for a little bit each time she goes. And so on the inside, we see Artoria go through her life as an early child all the way up until this point, right? So winter is basically her being born and being sent into the Tintigo village where she's born and raised up until she's 16, just learning about the child of prophecy. But they basically hate her, despise her, or are indifferent towards her because the fairies don't believe in the child of prophecy, or at least if they do, they don't believe it enough to really put full stock behind it, right? The only people that really did are the round table army or Morgan because she knows. And so while she's like six years old, she's trading with the, the staff of selection and she hears Merlin's voice through the staff. And so for a year, she's just training under Merlin, learning about magic, learning about all this type of stuff, right? And just about the world. And while he isn't able to be there physically, he's giving her as much knowledge as he can. But somebody saw her training after all that time, reported it to the village, and they took away her staff until she turned 16. So for 10 years, she couldn't talk to Merlin at all. Then we cut to the autumn time memories where she becomes Ector's apprentice, which was one of Asex's friends during her journey. And he's basically a blacksmith, right? We saw him in the fragments. So if you remember him, he was just the guy in the huge suit of armor next to Habitra and Mash. And so once Artoria goes over to him, she's just learning all about blacksmithing and everything. She's learning the tech and learning about Hector and how good of a person he actually is and how good he is compared to the fairies themselves. And through being an apprentice of his, he got to be Barkus way before she became the child of prophecy legitimately. And Barkus didn't think of her much back then because she was so weak. And then we go to the summertime memories where we see the fairies basically beg Artoria to go and kill Hector. And she tries to go over there and do it because even though they treated her like garbage, she literally lost two toes because she was in the barn the whole time. She never had a home. And during winter, they froze off. So she goes to try to kill Hector, but she just can't bring herself to do it. So she leaves and the fairies find out about this and they, they put her in prison, right? And so Woodwolves is basically sent here to execute the Child of Prophecy. But Hector, he basically makes an escape route for her, gets her the Staff of Selection and sends her off on her own, right? Because he was so severely injured though, he literally dies in her hands. And that's the end of Hector. So now she's just going around all of Fairy Burton trying to prove that she's the child of prophecy, but she can't because people don't believe her or they don't believe the prophecy itself. So she goes to the waking force hoping that she can forget her memories, but she can't because she's the child of prophecy. So she pretends to forget her memories. And then this is where she meets Fujimaru and she pretends to play along with it, but she actually stuck with him because of how earnest and how hopeless he looked. She wanted to help him. And so this is where the good memories start, the spring memories. But we don't cut away to any spring memory. She doesn't leave because to her, she doesn't have any good memory. And so on the outside, we have Muramasa talking to Merlin and how, yeah, if Artoria goes through with making Excalibur, she's going to disappear. She's not going to be there anymore. And it's the sacrifice that she had to make. And she knew this all along. She's willingly doing it. But then Merlin starts talking about the other things that they're going to have to do when they go back right after everything is done. How... Vargas is actually a calamity. She's the child of calamity, just like how Artoria is the child of prophecy. And so if they don't stop her or her Ninos, those two are going to bleed out of this lost belt and are going to become proper human history threats that will basically be on the level of a small incineration of humanity that Gaetia tried to do in part one. So if they don't stop it, it's over. They're cooked. And so once Artoria comes back, and then the spring memories don't happen. They go over to where the Excalibur forge is, right? And so she enters and she's just seeing everything fade away from her. She's dying. 
But then Muramasa comes in last second and he's just like, yo, I'm a blacksmith, dog. And so she's just there like, why would you do this? You're going to die if you do. And he's like, hey, I mean, I believed you. I followed you since the beginning. I'm going to believe in you to the very end. He dies making this weapon, even though he still has that promise to the foreign god. It doesn't matter. You know, he believed in her. And so once Atoria comes back, everybody's like, oh, shoot, you're back. You're not dead. That's so fire. But then they realize Muramasa is gone, so they saw what the trade-off was. But she manages to bring back the concept of Excalibur. So now we have that divine construct, or at least we can make one from Excalibur. And now we have a weapon for defeating the foreign god. We came here looking for the Rongo Miniads, and we left with this. And so they all get sent back in time by an hour before Hernanos came out of the pit. So Merlin's basically like, all right, so you guys are going to stop Vargas, stop Hernanos, and once everything's done, Burton Bush should be good, and you guys are going to be able to leave. Mission complete. So my interpretation of this is that Artoria found some type of kinship with Vargas because you have one who's a child of prophecy and one who's a child of calamity. So maybe Artoria found like, oh shoot, maybe you and I aren't so different even though you're an established, accomplished knight and I'm just some hick from Tintagel. And I could see that same sort of connection with her and Percival because Percival was the substitute child of prophecy. And I don't think Artoria knew that, but we could kind of tell like, oh, she has the spear selection, or she has the staff, so they kind of could bond over that fact. But now with that behind us, we move on from the moment of stars born and progress until interlude number two. So now with interlude two, we get to see Melusine's perspective of what's going on in Britain. So she goes over to Salisbury to see what Aurora's doing. And when she gets there, she sees that Coral isn't there. So when she asks Aurora about her disappearance, Aurora just tells her like, oh yeah, I killed her because her questions of morality were really starting to get annoying. And this is where we really get to see Aurora's true side, even though I said that like three times already. Aurora is about being beloved by the people. So if anybody else is getting more attention to her, like let's say Queen Morgan, Noctoria, or Artoria, she deals with them. And that's why her assassination on Octoria was so ill-advised, because even Spriggan knew, like, yo, we need a ruler in this Britain, so why would you kill her right now? <laughs> Aurora asks Melusine to bring her over to proper human history after everything's done, but Melusine knows if Aurora went over there, she wouldn't be able to do anything like she did here. It just wouldn't work. Fairies are not like humans. So to save her because she loves her, she decides to kill her, so she runs her lance right through her, and she leaves her there. And because Aurora isn't there keeping Melusine's form, Melusine transforms into Albion. So now with all that said and done, we move on for Interlude 2 and go into a certain prophecy. Everybody's back on the storm border, and now we have plans on what we want to do with Vargas and what we do with Hernanos, right? But we find out that there's a third calamity, and that third calamity is Albion, aka Melusine. Because after she killed Aurora, she became Albion. And so now we have to take care of her because she's attacking the ship. And the reason why she's attacking the ship instead of the way she did it before, where she didn't at all, everybody's like, oh yeah, because Artoria's here now. She has a means of stopping all these calamities. So now they're instinctively going towards her to stop her. So Percival gets on top of the storm border and uses himself to attract Albion's attention. And then the rest of us are fighting her, right? And the reason why that works is because you gotta remember Percival's still her brother. And even though Albion is just Albion now, Melusine is still deep, deep, deep inside of that. So once they manage to defeat her, she tries to run away, but Percival uses the spear selection to damage her fatally. And because of that, Percival vanishes into dust because that was the last use of the spear selection that he could use before he died. So now Albion is gone, we don't have to worry about her for now. And so now we direct our eyes to Vargas and Hernanos. They just want to take care of Hernanos because he's the bigger threat. But Mash decides like, yeah, I want to go down there and fight Vargas while we have the time to recoup, right? They have 40 minutes of leeway to repair the storm border, right? They decide that, all right, Mash, Fujimaru, and Munier are going to take the shadow border all the way down to Norwich since Vargas is on their way there. So if we take care of her here, we won't have to worry about her later in proper human history. So she isn't an enemy of it. So Mash and everybody go down there, and now we fight Vargas. So as we go on to fight Vargas, the then she actually makes her own mission and goes to Salisbury to get Habitrot and the carrier prison that we had. 
So as she gets there, she sees Mike, she thanks him and says her final goodbyes before getting all the things and leaving. And Mike is super sad about this. So he's about to turn to Amores because of his pure passion. But then knowing that Da Vinci's a free spirit, he stops himself. He just sits there crying, just realizing that the best thing that happened to him is gone now. So with that out the way, Da Vinci's back in the storm border and now we're in the shadow border going to Bargus. And Munir and Fujimaru can't leave it because of the crazy manager that we've seen before in Act 1 and Act 2. So it's up to MASH to fight her alone. She manages to summon Gawain and Lancelot because of the fact that Lancelot and Gawain both exist right now in Fairy Britain. And so those two manage to help defeat Bargus with their crazy strength, managing to put her at ease, to put her to rest. Because Bargus, before she died, she actually saw everybody in Manchester eating and killing all the humans because apparently that's what she did to her lover. The reason why she didn't remember is because somebody put a seal on her memory so she didn't lose her mind so that people still thought like, oh yeah, Adonis is still alive or at least she thought so. So once she found that out, she just started tweaking out because she should have became a calamity a long time ago. But at that moment, as soon as she figured that out, she's like, yeah, none of these fairies in Manchester can go back to proper human history. So that's the end of Bargus. But then we move on to Hernanos, right? Now that everybody's back on the storm border after having defeated those two calamities, all that's left is him. And we go over to Camelot and we're basically just trying to take him down. But we can't because the curses are regenerating his flesh. Regenerate faster than we can do damage to him. So the only way that we think we can beat him is basically by getting the 12 Rongo mini ads that Morgan had in store, right? So Artoria, before they even finished the sentence, went over to Camelot to get those Rongo mini ads and she manages to fire them and it almost kills her. They don't do enough damage to take down Hernanos. And so she's there like, all right, well, that's not going to work because this is meant for Morgan. So how do I fire these so that we can do enough damage, right? And as she realizes, she is the concept of Excalibur now. So why not just reroute it through herself, making her basically a pseudo Excalibur? So she does that and it pierces Hernanos because he has a divine core, right? And if you remember all the way back at the end of Morgan, Babo and Sith fell down into the pit and she prayed to Hernanos, basically saying like, yo, please just kill these fairies. So she basically became the divine core for Hernanos now. But Artoria manages to do some serious damage and now that he's regenerating, Caldea has to find a way to kill him. They don't have any serious way to do damage to him. But Habitrot, since Da Vinci went to go get her, she brought the Black Barrel that she had all the way back from Sheffield. And the reason why she didn't give him to the crew sooner was because if she gave the Black Barrel to Mash, Mash would remember her. And Morgan erased Habitrot, Mash, and her memories so that they wouldn't erase each other whenever they remember each other because there would be a contradiction. When she remembers about Habitrot, Habitrot starts fading away. And I'll be honest with you, this scene definitely got me tearing up. Uh, I was crying for sure because this scene, seeing Habitrot and Mash from the very beginning of the story all the way back in Sheffield in Act 1, and then Asak and her journey in Act 2, and then seeing this be the conclusion in Act 3, it hurt because I really liked Habitrot. Because of that, Mash and Fujimaru managed to fire off a black bull shot, piercing Hernanos' divine core, killing him leaving Kokolin up on the top of the storm border with Mash and Fujimaru basically being like yeah so I'm dying so I'm gonna dip like I'm gonna I'm gonna disintegrate because I'm a servant from proper human history I helped you guys out but that's all I could really do now so I'll see you guys later and the reason why he's so injured is because he actually defended the storm border from all the hands of Hernanos that are trying to, to to destroy it the second time at least not the first time I didn't mention that so he's gone now he's dematerialized so now nobody's left. Literally, it's all the people from the Storm Border crew. And that's it. Because Artoria disintegrated as soon as she fired that Excalibur shot. So now everybody's just like, oh, shoot. It's over. We did it. We won. <laughs> we have a divine construct. We won. We lived. And now we can go back to Trimajestus III and Novum Caldea. And Sion, too. Don't forget. I don't think I forgot about her. <laughs> so once everything is done, we see Oberon show up on top of the Storm Border. But something is amok. And we notice, like, yo, this is not Oberon. This is not him. And everybody on the storm board is like, yeah, this, his spirit origin is just fluctuating like crazy. This is not him. And so he's telling everybody, like, yeah, so I'm alive. I'm glad to see you guys are all here. And that it's not over. It's definitely not over. And we see Blanca's dead because all the malice directed towards Oberon was absorbed by her. And so he just kicks her off of the storm border. She's dead. And we see his true nature. 
this isn't Oberon. This is Oberon Vortigern, a mix of the, the Midnight Summer Dream Fairy and the will of Britain itself to kill itself. They mix together. And so he's been scheming from this very beginning of the story, basically on how he can kill all of Britain because he just hate he hates everything. Once he reveals his true name, we see a conceptual insect creature just come through. And it's basically, if you go and get absorbed by it, you're gonna fall forever. You're not gonna be able to escape it. It's like a black hole, but a black hole at least has an escape. This does not. You're in it, and once you're in it, you're not leaving. And so with that reveal that marks the end of a certain prophecy, we move on to the final section of Lost Belt 6, Midsummer Night's Dream. So now we start with the finale to Lost Belt 6, a Midsummer Night's Dream. And this basically continues right where we left off for Oberon. He's explaining like, yeah, I've been here since the beginning. I've been plotting, scheming, finding a way to just destroy Britain because of Vortigern's desire but also Oberon's desire is to destroy proper human history so he had to find a way to do both. It took a long time because Morgan was a threat and he had to find a way to destroy Morgan. Herdenos was a threat so he had to find a way to destroy Herdenos so he could fully flourish and the first person to show up, the best person to show up be it, was Fujimaru themselves because he was from proper human history. He didn't want to fight Morgan but the only way it could go down was by doing that. Herninos then showed up, which was restricted by Morgan, and so they had to beat them as well. And he just had to move a lot of pieces together and away from each other to make sure that everything played perfectly into the revival. Everything played perfectly into his full awakening and reveal. So once he talks about all that, Caldea falls into the insect, into the conceptual insect. And so now, when Fujimaro wakes up from falling into the insect, Oberon's just like, yo, so I'm gonna give you a choice. You can either fall asleep and die, or you can fight me and die, you know? Either way, you know, it's, it's not much, but I'm giving you the option. And Fujimaru seeing a star in a distant dream is just like, yeah, sure, I'll fight you. And then Artoria Caster shows up after Fujimaru summons her out of nowhere, because she showed up out of pure will, and she's in her final ascension, and this is what I've been waiting for the entire story. When was her final ascension going to show up? <laughs> and it's here. And then Mash wakes up too, and they're... Everybody on the border is waking up as well, and now it's Artoria, Mash, and Fujimaru versus Oberon. And so now it's just pure beef on site. And let me tell you, Herdenos was a hard fight, like a really difficult fight, probably the hardest in the game. But Oberon was a very close second. Oh my goodness, this is insane. This fight is so difficult. <laughs> Fujimaru falls asleep during the fight, and he starts dreaming of him and Oberon talking, because they're talking to each other through dreams. And Oberon's just like, so you wanted to know about my real reason right and he's like proper human history just disgusts me because of the fact that they don't allow fantasies to exist oberon himself is from a fantasy a midsummer night's dream so the fact that caldea is just going around pruning all these fantasies is just evil to him right so he wanted to stop it it's not it's not a heroic act it's not a deed he's doing it because he hates them as well and so once oberon tells fujimaru to wake up he's defeated and Altoria injured him fatally and knocked him off of the stone border. Now leaving those three on top of the stone border, right? And Artoria disappears because just like Merlin, she only came here through sheer will determination. So she's like, listen, you guys are going to make it out alive, all right? And then she leaves. So now the stone border crew's falling and they don't know what to do because since this falls infinitely, they don't really have a way to get out. There's no, en there's no entrance, there's no exit. But because Melusine was still alive, as I mentioned earlier, she manages to make an exit for Caldea because she saw the insect as a threat to Britain. And so Caldea manages to get out and the insect is destroyed. And so now they're just there looking over Britain well, the way it was back like 14,000 years ago, where it was just a giant blue sea with a giant blue sky. And everybody's just having a good time looking out at the sky because it's been so long. All they've seen for 50 days was just Britain's orange sky, you know, and Britain was beautiful. Artoria admits that. He, she just wanted Mash and Fujimaru to see that, like, Britain was beautiful, you know, at a certain point. Even if the fairies were evil, even if some of the people were just downright sinister, and what happened here was truly a tragedy. Britain, at its core, was a beautiful place. And so as everybody's watching the sky, they're all just happy, having a great time, just remembering what happened. 
and they go back inside to the storm border, ready to go back to Novum Caldea after having beat Lost Belt 6. And we see Sion in the post credits, basically, in the, in the epilogue, just like, oh, shoot, they did it. Nice. With two minutes to spare, too. So that's pretty crazy. But now we just have to find out what we're going to do with Konya Scania since she's still a beast. And what we're going to do after that, you know, we have to plan. But for now, let's just see them come back. That's the end of Lost Belt 6. So a couple things I forgot to mention in the video. Number one was Spriggan's death. Spriggan died to Vargas when she came over to Norwick and then was going over to Oxford. I forgot to mention it because I generally did not care about him, which I'm sorry if that comes off as rude. I just, there's certain characters I prefer and do not prefer. <laughs> Next is Oberon's arm. So the person that killed Murian was Oberon and we could tell because that same arm that showed up in that story bit was Oberon's arm. And then after that, we have Oberon as a pretender as well. So he literally created a new class because of how specific his case is. Because he's literally a mix of Vortigern from Britain and from the midst of when I should dream Oberon. Both of them mixed together. They're two in the same body. And I think there's certain cases in this game where that's actually a thing. But they're more also egos. But I don't know. It's, it, it's a cool thing that he created his own class. After that, we have Aurora's death. So while she was dying, she got to see Albion aka Melusine fly around above her and what she realized as she was mulling over her death was basically the one nice thing that she did in her life was take in Melusine and take care of her. Even though she was just doing it to show off to her followers, that in itself was a genuine act to take care of somebody. Last but not least, we have the fairy knights, right? So all the fairy knights that Morgan had, we have the obvious ones with Babo and Sith, Bargus, and then we have Melusine, right? But then we have the other ones that weren't so obvious. What Hector, and then we have Tamlin, Habitra, and then we have Mash. So she technically had six knights. So with that out of the way, let me tell you all about my share factory struggles. The thing I used to edit these videos. So this video took a lot longer to get out, and I'm sorry about that. I think it's going to be five days since the last time I uploaded when this comes out. And the reason for that is because I use share factory to edit, right? It's a PlayStation uh, tool to edit videos that you make. And I have learned a lot of things from doing this. And some of them is that if a video is too long, it will crash the system. So, <laughs> my thing crashed twice and I had to restart a good majority of the video. I didn't lose too, too much progress to where I would have to scrap it and just start over. But I had to redo some parts where it took multiple days to do. So today I'm literally redoing the last portion because it crashed on me yesterday, like at 9. And I, I, I literally was talking to Reaper about it and I was on the fringe of a mental breakdown, bro. I was so upset. Literally because I forgot to save once. Literally only one time and I would have been able to continue. But I didn't because I'm an idiot. <laughs> And so now I'm here, able to finish it, I'm going to render it, I'm going to upload it, and you guys are going to see it. But man, this video just took a lot out of me, even more than the other one, which was a two-parter, which is crazy. <laughs> so with all that said and done, I have learned a lot from this. I've learned a lot about FGO, I learned a lot about editing, and now I can really say that I can edit more videos in good faith. At least I hope I can. <laughs> Regardless though, my thoughts on Lost Belt 6 Act 3, I thought it was great. Definitely my favorite part of Lost Spell 6. I would have to rank it 3 at the top, then 1 in the middle, and then 2 at the bottom. I just still can't get over some parts that really kind of bored me a little bit. But overall, Lost Spell 6, it's a 9.5 to a 10. Altogether, it's amazing. And Act 3 really solidified that because I haven't cried reading FGO in a very long time. I think the last time was probably Gatia at the end of Solomon and all that. But here, like, it got me multiple times, whether it's with Habitrot, or Bargist, or the end where we're singing the blue sky, and just all the sad character deaths overall. This story was so good. I, I don't want to rehash what I was saying before, because I've already gone on length to say my opinion on Lost Belt 6. But just know, my opinion hasn't changed. This story is amazing. One of the best stories I've ever read, and one of the best stories I've read from FGO, period, you know? So if you haven't really gone through and tried to read it, I definitely recommend it. And honestly, that's going to be it for me for now. Thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoy. This has been such an endeavor, but I want to change it for the world. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Hopefully more videos will be more frequent, but not like daily uploads. I'm still trying to figure out the kinks about that. I've been saying them a bunch throughout the end of these videos, but just know 
there will be a plan coming up soon. So for now, hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching if you made it all the way to the end. And I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.